بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم تسليم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين سبحانك لا علمنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to open up our hearts to these very lofty meanings that inshallah ta'ala are a means to bring an abundant amount of spiritual light to them that will inshallah ta'ala open up the doors for us to tread the path and draw near to him bi'idhnillah ta'ala. We have reached the 87th aphorism and in it Ibn Al-Ta'ila Sikandai radiallahu ta'ala anhu wa nafa'ana bi'ulumihi fit darin ameen he says التيو الحقيقي أن تطوي مسافة الدنيا أنك حتى ترى الآخرة أقرب إليك منك So this could be translated, and this is Thomas Cleary's translation, the real crossing is when you cross the distance of the world from yourself until you see the hereafter closer to you than yourself. Alternatively, it could be rendered the real folding up of distance is to fold up the distance of the world from yourself so that you see the hereafter, hereafter closer to you than yourself. So this is essentially that summarized in this last bit of seeing the hereafter closer to you than your own self. And in it, the commentators tend to emphasize the importance of yaqeen, certitude, and zuhud, this great trait of detachment. So let's look at these words. You have this first word, which is طي. And this is the mustar or the verbal noun for the trilateral root. طوى يطوي. طوى يطوي طيّن. And this is literally to fold something or to fold up. So you would fold a garment or you would fold up a piece of paper. But it also means to cross or to traverse. يعني to cover a distance outwardly quickly. So you talk about طويت مسافة طويلة that I traveled a large distance. So this word طي has both of these meanings. And here it's referring to something else. And here it's referring to something that is within the realm, and we're going to get to this, of possibility for Allah's special servants. And it's possible for certain things to be folded up for people. It could be that spatially, or it could be in terms of someone's time. But what he's saying here is that he wants to teach us about al tayyil haqiqi. What is the real folding up? The real folding up and tatwiya. So here he uses it in its verbal form, and then he uses it in its verbal form. So and tatwiya. So first is a verbal noun, and then use it as a verb. And tatwiya. What are we folding up now? Masafa. The masafa of something is its distance. Kam masafa? How far away is it? Masafa dunya anka. The distance of the world anka from your own self. Hmm. That's really interesting. So this is a, not a type of physical distance that we're talking about now. This is a tay al ma'nawi. This is a spiritual distance. This is a figurative distance. We're not talking about something in outward that distance here. And so, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this world so that we can learn about things and then apply them to the spiritual path. So one of the poets said, إِنَّمَا الْكَوْنُ مَعَانٍ قَائِمَاتٌ بِالصُّورِ The cone, the entire universe, its reality is that it is meanings, ma'anin, erected in images. Anyone who recognizes this is from the true people of intellect. So the whole world in and of itself and everything in it points to spiritual meanings, points to the abode of the spirit, points to meanings that you and I need on the path to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything in it. And this is what we're taught to do, is to read the signs. And just as you have to learn how to read a book, you're not born a reader. 
When you learn a language, what do you do? You start to first learn the letters of that language. And then you start to learn how to connect those various letters. And then eventually that you can recognize words. And then you can read sentences. And then you can read paragraphs and read very quickly. And then you can extrapolate meanings. And then you become a great reader. And there's even books on how to read a book. The famous book by that Mortimer that uh, Adler. And you'd be so look, but do we really know how to read? There's levels of reading. And that it gets very complex. How then? The more knowledge that we have and then all the associations that we make, and this is why there's constantly people writing new things because new knowledge is not produced by the unique associations that are made within people's minds. So the point here is, is that there is physical distance and then there's spiritual distance. And we know in the outward world that if we're going to go somewhere, there's certain things that you and I have to do. And if anyone's ever traveled in a pre-modern sense, I remember in the days of Mauritania in West Africa, it was really interesting to experience pre-modern travel. And I've never checked, but I might have been able to get in the Guinness Book of World Records on my first trip to Mauritania for the most modes of transportation in one trip. Because there was the ones that we all know. There was obviously a car. There was obviously a plane. But in addition to that, that we rode a ferry. We rode a train. We rode a donkey. And that uh, uh, we could probably think about some other things there too as well. Anyhow, the point is, is that pre-modern travel was very different. In pre-modern travel, this is why we have what is called marhalatan. And that this is the difference that you can normally travel that at walking at a good pace, which is 50 miles. Because if you walk at an average pace, you're going to walk, walk roughly, what, about a 20-minute mile. So that if you that times that by eight hours, which is roughly the amount that an average person would walk in a day, you get that mark of about 24, 25 miles. And then two days distance becomes 50. So for traveling, that becomes the marker. These are fitra, these are the measurements of the natural disposition. And um, people tended to measure in terms of hand spans and arm spans and arms stretched out and things of this nature. This is a part of our natural disposition. Um, anyhow, there's different distances that you and I have. Now, in reality, the most important travel of all is the travel to our Lord. It's the travel to Allah. This is the travel that really matters. No one in their right mind is going to start traveling and not know where they're going. No one in their right mind, if they know they have a long travel ahead of them, is not going to prepare. And so the real travel, which is that all the travel that you and I are all on, but it's important to recognize that we are all traveling, i.e. that we are traveling through this world and the hereafter is ever approaching. And as the Arabs say, Kulu atin qarib. Everything that is coming, in reality, is near. Everything that is coming is near. And so this is why our Prophet وسلم, wanted us to be aware of death. <laughs> Remember often the ender of pleasures, which is death. Death is closer to us than our sandal strap. Yani, than the own socks that we're wearing, the very laces on our shoes, or whatever the modern version of that would be. It's closer to us than we could possibly imagine. In reality, it could be the next breath, khalas. And sudden death is one of the signs of the end of time. Sudden death used to be very rare in the pre-modern world. And nowadays, someone could be just fine, all of a sudden, heart attack, and they drop dead. May Allah try to protect us and preserve us and give us good health and bless us to live long lives, productive lives in His obedience and attain high degrees of closeness to Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the point of saying all of that is to recognize the outward distances that we travel for our physical voyages. The most important travel of all is not the outward. Even though it's possible when it comes to play, and this is coming, that for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to fold up the earth for someone where they travel a long distance in a very short period of time by way of saintly miracle. But what he wants us to recognize here is 
this is not really the criterion, even though naturally we're we incline towards marvelous things. Breaking norms are amazing. And to a certain degree, this was an important part of our hagiographical literature that speaks about the great saints and righteous people that came before us to indicate their piety. This was spoken about and that there's nothing wrong with this. This is actually a good thing. And we are taught to learn and believe in saintly miracles. And they're mentioned in the book of Allah Ta'ala. And we're going to be mentioning one in the story of the King Solomon, but also in relation to that Maryam, who was the mother of Jesus, alayhi salam. And she was a Siddiqah. She wasn't a prophetess, even though there are some opinions that she was, that in the dominant opinions that you have to be male in order to be a prophet, but she was a Siddiqah. Wa ummu Siddiqah, the Quran says. And his mother was a high saint. And so that when she was delivering that Isa, the Prophet Jesus, Allah Ta'ala says, وَهُزِّ إِلَيْخِ بِجِذِ النَّخَلَةِ تُصَاقَتْ عَلِكِ رُطْبًا جَنِيَةً She was near a date palm tree. And Allah Ta'ala says, shake the date palm tree. And that there will be that fresh dates that come down for you. Now, if anyone has ever been in a place where there's date palms, is that the only way to get dates off of date palms is to scale the tree and then to cut the cluster. They're very tall and they're extremely heavy. You're not going to be able to move it like that, especially if she's about to, someone's about to give birth where you're as weak as you could be. This was a saintly miracle. And this is also why they say is that dates are a very good food for a woman who is uh, expecting. So this was a miracle. And then even the immaculate birth itself was a saintly miracle of that Maryam alayhi salam who was one of the greatest women who ever lived. And there's actually a whole chapter in the Quran about her. And that she was also the one that, that inspired Zakaria, who was taking care of her. When he saw that he'd come into Mary, that his, her mother, Hannah, had made a special prayer. She vowed that the child that was in the room, well, she was going to give that child to the temple. And then Allah blessed her with a girl. And she was worried because only the boys, only men and boys could enter into the temple. But they realized that she was special. And that Sayyidina Zakaria built for her that a place in the temple. And no one could reach her. He was behind several doors and only a ladder had to get up to there. And he would go in into the quarters of Maryam where there's no other way to get in. And she'd have the fruits of the winter in the summer and the fruits of the summer in the winter. And then the Quran says, Hunarika da'a Zakariya Rabba. Then in there did Zakariya, yani Zakaria, call upon his Lord. And eventually that Zakariya that gives birth to the Prophet John the Baptist, Yahya alayhi salam. Anyhow, that we know that saintly miracles are part of the Quran speaks of them. And we'll talk about those that were with King Solomon in a little bit. So what is the core meaning here that he wants to get across to us is, is that the real folding up of distance, the real crossing is to fold up the distance of the world from yourself. And in Arabic, even it's a little bit difficult, uh, but it has to be unpacked. To fold up the distance of the world from yourself, right? And um, what does it mean? That oftentimes because of what is called wahm, our illusions and delusions and our fanciful imaginations, we create all of these veils between us and our Lord. And it seems so far away. And when we're immersed in this world and absorbed in its vanities, it is far away. But this is what he's saying is that the real folding up of distance is not being able to just take one step and end up in another place. It's to have this illusory distance that we set up for ourselves between us and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be folded up for us. But what does it then lead to? That until or so that, what? Tara al akhirata. That you then see the akhirah, which is the hereafter. 
that literally which comes next. And the reason that we call it al yawm al-akhir is that what? The last day? Because there's no darkness after that. The alternation of night and day here in this world is a sign of Allah. But in the hereafter, there's only daytime. And the light in paradise is light without a beaming hot sun. It is a very cool light, similar to the light just before sunrise, which is if we get in tune with the natural uh, that way things work, and we get back to that rising early, getting in touch with the rising of the sun, that dawn, getting in touch with the sun's movements, the setting of the sun, is that these are amazing signs from Allah. And that's one of the most peaceful and beautiful times of all, just before the sun rises, 10 or 15 minutes. And this is a very beautiful time. And even in very hot climates like the Arabian Peninsula, this tends to be a cool time even on the hottest of days. The sun is not yet risen. So that's what paradise is like. It's that sun, the light is a cool light, similar to that light just before sunrise. And what are we seeing? The akhir, the hereafter. Aqrab ilayka minka. So first of all, he was talking about distance. But now he's talking about being closer to. So what? He says that so that you see the hereafter closer to you than yourself. Literally, your own self. Which is an amazing meaning. That someone could be here in this world and reach a state that they're living in the world, but they're not of the world. They're a person dedicated to the hereafter. This is the essence of what our religion teaches us. To be in the world, but not to be of the world. We have a mission here on earth. We have a duty that must be performed here on earth. But we're not meant to remain here. That were this world to have been a place to remain, he surely would have let the most beloved of people to him, i.e. the prophets, remain here. But the prophets returned to God. So it can't be a place that anyone would want to ever really stay. And were that this really to, that being that a place to be, Allah wouldn't have given it to people who disbelieve in him. So you could have a disbeliever who has a lot more worldly things than a believer. In fact, that believers tend to, that have straightened circumstances, they tend to go through a lot of tribulations. So, this is essentially the linguistic breakdown. Let's look a little bit more closely at some of its meanings. So, the reason he says this is because when we talk about saintly miracles, it is possible that a breaking of the norm happens on the hand of someone and it's not really an indication that they are right with Allah. The greatest indication that we are right with our Lord is that we're people of istiqamah, we're upright. Uprightness, dedication to prophetic teachings is the true indication. And you could even go a little bit deeper and say, the real breaking of the norm is breaking the norms of the self. What we mean by self here in Arabic, the nafs, your ego. Your ego has norms. It is accustomed to liking certain things, inclining towards certain things. When you break that and go against those norms and tread the spiritual path and force yourself to be the way that you know you need to be and to submit whether you like it or not and that follow prophetic teachings and patiently endure the difficulty in doing so, then you start to become pure. And the less grip that the ego has on you, the closer your heart is to reaching its Adamic potential, which is essentially connected to the Ruh, which is the spirit. And so, what does it mean, though, to have this distance of the world from ourselves be folded up? This means that you and I cease to lean on it, to rely upon it. And when the light of certitude comes to the heart, what then happens is, is the 
world ceases to have a place in our eyes. It is such that the hereafter is right before us, ever present. And the only reason that's not our state right now is because of our weak state of certitude. When you and I read the book of Allah, the Quran, Allah is speaking to us directly. He is telling us about reality as it is. This is reality. This is why reading the Quran obliterates illusion. And it's highly recommended every time you want to make a big decision in your life, read what you can from the book of Allah. And again, a seeker is not a seeker until he finds everything that he or she is seeking in the Quran. It's all there if we open up our hearts and our minds to its meanings. And yes, there are that things we might have to do, we might have to research, or things we might have to learn, of course. But it's all there. And so what happens, and as a result of this certitude that arises in the heart, is that then it motivates us to do various acts of righteousness, acts of worship, acts of obedience, good deeds, such that it's as if that we are seeing paradise right before our eyes. It's if they're, it's right before our eyes. This is what certitude does for us. Just as we do whatever we can to avoid anything that would distance us from Allah Ta'ala, any type of wrong action, because it is as if that we are seeing the punishment of hell right before our eyes. And one of the amazing things about the Quran is that the references to paradise, there's an equal number of references to the fire. And this is why fear and hope are like two wings of the believer, that we want to maintain a balance as long as we're living. Until we reach our latter moments, then there should be a preponderance of hope where we just hope in the mercy of Allah. Let none of you die, save that he has a good opinion of his Lord. That Allah is going to forgive us and to cover our mistakes and admit us into paradise. So, what happens then is, Allah allows us to be able to travel this spiritual distance very quickly. And this only comes from His favor. But this is what we should be seeking, and this is why He's telling us this. He doesn't want our heart to be attached to anything of a worldly nature, even if it be a marvelous thing. And from here, the scholars of this science speak about hujab, latifa, and kathifa. There are thin veils and there are thick veils. In other words, there are veils between us and knowing our Lord. Some of those veils are thick and some of those veils are thin. And the difference the scholars of the spiritual past say is the thick veils you have to turn away from, whereas the thin veils you have to travel through. And so the thick veils are veils of darkness, and the thin veils are veils of light. So veils of darkness are like wrong actions, doing haram, like the uh, being dragged into that excessive focus on worldly things, so the world in and of itself, and things of that nature. Veils of light are things like having spiritual experiences. Someone could have a spiritual experience, and it's powerful, but someone has to remind themselves that that's not what this is about. It's not about having the spiritual experience. It's about coming to know Allah. That's the goal. And Allah says in the Quran, this is one of the meanings of this verse, وَأَنَّ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ الْمُنْتَهَىٰ And indeed, unto your, your Lord is the ultimate end. That's what we're seeking. Allah. Closeness to Allah. Gnosis. Knowledge of Allah. And so, if we're blessed with this state where we start to see the hereafter closer to us, 
then to our own selves, what happens? Look at what one of the commentators says here. Is that dukathania muntawiya? Is it you in and of yourself are a created thing? And we know that all created things are perishing. They're moving into a state of non-existence. And in reality, in and of ourselves, we're not to be for the necessarily existent, our Lord, we wouldn't even have existence because our existence is contingent upon the existence of Allah. And so once someone realizes that, is that then that someone is aware that they in and of themselves don't, we shouldn't place ourselves in a position that Allah has not put it in. So when someone attains this degree of certitude, in a very real way, because of the lack of noticing their own self, it is as if they are that hyper aware of these otherworldly realities, such that they forget their own self. And so that they see the hereafter, which is something that Allah has made permanent, being closer to them than their own selves, because that they have that cease to notice their own selves. So again, we've, as we've said consistently throughout these lessons over the weeks, the spiritual path is completely opposite to almost everything we're being taught in the modern world. If you just follow the necessary conclusions of the worldly life that people are now exposed to and what that will lead someone to if they actually follow that path, and the egotism that arises as a result is that there's no way to draw near to Allah if you have a strong ego. You can't. It's by scholarly consensus that the greatest veil between us and our Lord is our own ego. It is worse than even the devil, shaitan, and iblis trying to leave us astray. It's the strongest veil of all that you and I have to work to overcome. So, one of the commentators, Sidi Ahmed ibn Ajiba, he gives a very health, uh, helpful breakdown about the different types of what are called tay. Tay, again, is a folding up of a distance. And he says, you have what is called tay zaman a folding up of time. Just as you have what is called tay makan a folding up of a physical distance. Then you have what is called dunya, the folding up of the world. And then you have what's called nufus, the folding up of the ego. And he says, as for the first one, zaman, the folding up of time, is that this is something that is possible. And so we know that in the blessed story of the late Isra Mi'raj, our Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, he traveled by night from Mecca and Mukarrama all the way to Jerusalem. He led all the prophets in prayer, and then he ascended into heaven. And he went through the first heaven, the second, all the way beyond the seventh heaven. And then he was at the Siddharat al-Muntaha, went beyond the furthest most lot tree into the presence of Allah. And when he came back, some narrations indicate that his pillow in his bed was still warm. Meaning he went on this miraculous night journey and ascended into the seven heavens and went beyond, which is how long would this have taken? Well, you're not in the, at that point, the time-space continuum like you and I all experience it here. And then he comes back after this marvelous and miraculous journey and his the bed is still warm. That's tayyizaman. And Allah Ta'ala can also do this. There are stories of people, and Imam Anawi mentions this, in the, he mentions this in that the Adab Hamalat al-Qur'an, or the Adhkar, and he says is that the most that has reached us is people f doing complete readings of the Qur'an eight times a day. 
Now, outwardly, that's just not possible if you look at it by the hour clock and how the weight. The fastest reciters can recite a juz in maybe 15 minutes, outwardly. And there's 30 juz in the Quran. So if you just do the math then, you're looking at roughly seven hours, seven plus hours, let's say roughly seven hours. And so you, there's not enough hours in the day to do that. But what this means is Allah places blessing in the time for certain people. And the way that you and I experience time is very different. Some people have a lot of blessing in their time. And so time is that folded up for them in the sense that it's really actually what you would say is expanded for them. And folded up for them in terms of a lot happens, but outwardly there's only seemingly a little bit of time that passes. So these things are all well within the uh, possibility. You have tayyid zaman and tayyid makan. Allah can fold up time or He can fold up place, physical space, where He to want to, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And um, uh, one good example of that is the story of the Prophet Solomon, Suleiman alayhi salam, uh, in the Quran. And that this is in Surah An Naml, verses 38 to 41. So Allah Ta'ala says, Qala ya ayyu al malu, ayyukum yatini bi arshiha qabr an yatuni muslimin. Solomon asks, O oh chiefs, which of you can bring me her throne before they come to me? in full submission. So keep in mind that Solomon is that in the Levant, he's in the Philistine. And where is the Queen of Sheba's throne? It's in Ma'rab in the Yemen. You're talking about a long distance between the two. So he's saying to them in his meta, those who are with him, that who can bring me her throne? So how heavy is the throne of the Queen of Sheba? Who could ever carry that? And that's not even something you would even speak about, of how heavy it would be. So then Allah says, One mighty jinn responded, I can bring it to you before you rise from this council of yours. And I am quite strong and trustworthy for this task. So, several hours. Right, so that he's sitting, the council takes place, and then he rises. So that's still a miracle, a saintly miracle. How would you be able to do that otherwise? Right, this is the creation of the jinn. But then that Allah says, "Qala li andhu ilmun min al kitab," but the one who had knowledge of the scripture said, "Ana ati kabi qabil yon tadd ilayka tarfuk." I can bring it to you in the blink of an eye. In the blink of an eye. So when Solomon saw it placed before him, so he brought it in the blink of an eye. How's that possible? Outwardly, in relation to our own power and abilities, that's impossible. We could never do that. But it's possible for Allah Ta'ala to enable someone to instantaneously travel to Ma'rab and physically transport the throne to Palestine. Allah's Qadr al kulli shay. And this is Qur'an. You have to believe in this. And so, then, so when Suleiman saw it, قَالَ هَذَا مِنْ فَضْلِ رَبِّي لِيَبْلُوْنِ أَشْكُرَ مَكْفُرْ when Solomon saw it placed before him, he exclaimed, this is by the grace of my Lord to test me whether I am grateful or Ungrateful. So this is a clear example of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala folding up time and space for someone who's given knowledge of the scripture. And this is a saintly miracle. This is a karama. So then we have what is called tayyid dunya. And again, what this means is, is for the world to be folded up from you. In other words, all of the veils that arise by virtue of the attachments of this world, by being granted this great virtue of zuhud, renunciation, detachment, translated as you wish, is that all of a sudden you could have 
these vast distances that are metaphorical distances be folded up for you. And you traverse them very quickly from the bounty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that this is a, another aphorism, the, thir, the 136 aphorism, which is coming when we get there, says, لو أشرق نور اليقين في قلبك Were the light of certitude to shine in your heart لرأيت الآخر أقرب من أن ترح إليها You would see the hereafter so near that you wouldn't even feel that you need to travel towards it. You'd see it so near to you. And that you would see the eclipse of extinction had overcome the beauties of the world. This is tayyid dunya. And this is a great blessing for someone to be gifted this yaqeen, this certitude, to be gifted this great virtue of zuhd. So that we turn away and that we then are traveling the path now in a very different way because of our state of heart. And so he's saying that this is the tayyid haqiqi. And there also is this even other state called tayyid nafus, the folding up of the ego. And this is an even higher degree where now the ego ceases to be a barrier between us and our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he won't, he's really pointing us to seek what is even higher. So if we're trying to seek some type of saintly miracle outwardly, we have to know that that could be given to someone who's accepted by Allah or not accepted. Because when we speak of the breaking of the norms, the khawarak al-adat, they speak of seven different categories. The first is what's called a mu'jizah. And the Arabic words for them are significant because they point to their meaning, even though we speak of them all as breaking of the norms, the way that things normally run, the realm of science, the realm of uh, the scientific method, and so forth. And ultimately, everything that relates to science, true science, of things we see manifesting after, these are the sunan of Allah. These are the way that Allah Ta'ala has decreed for things to be. And so, the first is a mu'jiza, a prophetic miracle. And there's many. Prophets were sent with miracles. The Prophet Muhammad had miracles. The Prophet Jesus had miracles. The Prophet Moses had miracles. Ali The second is what is called an irhas. And this is a miracle that comes at the hands of a prophet before they become prophets. And there's a number of examples in the life of the Prophet Muhammad of that. The third is what's called a karama. A karama is a breaking at the nor of the norm that ha happens at the hands of a wali, someone who's special and close to Allah Ta'ala. And then the fourth is called a ma'una. This is the breaking of the norm that happens at the hands of a regular believer. But Allah Ta'ala assists them by doing this. And then the fifth is called istidraj. And this happens, and this is dangerous because in reality they're being led astray. Where things happen the way they want it to happen, but it's not a sign of their piety and closest to Allah. It's a sign actually that Allah Ta'ala is leading them astray. And so one of the greatest examples of that is in the end of time when the, that false Messiah comes. He'll be able to do miraculous things. And it's nothing else there, though to lead him further astray. And so there are some people that have amazing things that happen. But it's not really a sign that they are close to Allah. And so it's possible for a non-Muslim to have a breaking of the norm happen at their hands. If someone does very austere spiritual practices, things can happen. And this is why the scholars of the science have always said is that if you see someone walking on water or that floating in the air, is it weigh their actions with the Quran and the Sunnah, the Book of Allah and the way of the Prophet Muhammad? If they're in conformity, then that could be a righteous person. If not, then don't be fooled by that. And then the sixth category is what is called ihana. This is a breaking of the norm that happens opposite to what 
the person desires. So the classic example of the mission is Musaylim al-Kadab. There was a well that had a little bit of water. Someone said, please, can you put your spit in that water so that the water will grow? And so he spits into the well and it goes completely dry. Right? And the word ihana means to humiliate. And these are people that are, Musaylim was a false prophet. And then the seventh is what is called sihr, magic. And this is a connection that individuals have with the jinn, we a'udhu billah, and sihr is haram and evil. Anyhow, that these are the seven breakings of the norms. Uh, and ultimately none of it happens except by the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in and of itself, just because a breaking of the norm happens, it's not necessarily a proof unless there's other things, depending upon what category that we are talking about. So this is what he wants us to know here, is that we should be seeking the true that karama, the true breaking of the norm, which is none other than that istiqama, uprightness upon prophetic teachings. This is the true sign of someone being close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if we think about this, is that especially for people that are young, there's an opportunity. When we're young, we come into a world where we're being asked from the time they're very young, what do you want to be when you're older? And that's not really the right question. That's actually not good parenting skills, as people like Dr. Sachs and others have pointed out. There's better questions to ask them. But this whole, this world that we're brought into, and it starts so early nowadays, especially with these demonic phones that people have. They're inundated with a particular culture and a way of being and a way of thinking. And these desires arise to be a certain way, to carry themselves in a certain way, to dress in a certain way. And it's just completely worldly and lowly, usually. And... They've done statistics on this, the vast majority of people, if you ask them, what do you, what do you want to do when you're older? People either want to be rich or famous, or a combination of the two. You might have a few people here and there that want something other than that, but as if this is what we've been created for. And this is going to get worse and worse as we get closer and closer to the end of time. But then even in a certain sense, there are certain things that are natural, even outside of such a... Uh, you know, insidious culture like the one in which we live in. Is that people naturally, when you have that youthful passion, is that you have hopes, you have desires, you have things that you want to achieve in this world and so forth. And to a certain degree, that's not necessarily bad or wrong. It just has to be guided. But what he is saying is that all of these things, that these distances that you and I create in our minds and this lengthy amount of time that we have to live in order to achieve all of these things. He's saying, don't be fooled by all of that. Have your heart be with Allah. Develop certitude. See the hereafter closer to you than your own self. And it will pierce through all of these different things, many of which, which trap our young people, and then they live a life that is essentially empty, and by the time that they retire, they have nothing else to do, so they go volunteer at Walmart or something. Because they failed to build true meaning in their heart. And really, the most successful people that will have the greatest impact on the world not the impact that has a shelf life and is short-lived. Real impact that is real benefit, i.e. benefit that helps people in this world in a real sense and in the hereafter, is actually by detaching. No one was more detached than the Prophet Muhammad. And no one had more impact on the world than the Prophet Muhammad So actually, the best way that we can bring about true success and even the worldly manifestations of it is actually by detaching. Because the nature of this world, as we learn in a prophetic hadith is, is that the world has been commanded to serve those who turn away from it. You turn away from the world and the world will serve you. You run after it and you'll never catch it. So actually, you, you win twice over. 
but you're not seeking the things of this world anyway, but Allah gives it to you. And even if he only gives you a little, he will make you more content and better off even than people that have a lot. Because the Prophet Muhammad sought refuge from fakr, from poverty. But it wasn't what people thought. It was actually what he meant was the fear of poverty. Because if you're wealthy and you have the fear of poverty, you're still poor. Even if you have hundreds of thousands of dollars in your bank account. So these meanings are deep. And these are the type of meanings that you and I want to that tap into. And I'll just end by sharing a couple of quotes here, which are very profound, that highlights the importance of zuhd, of detachment. And he says, one of them said, لا تتعجم من يدخل يده في جيبه فيخرج ما يريد ولكن تعجم من يضع يده في جيبه ولم يجر شيء ولم يتغير. He said, don't be amazed by someone who puts their hand in the pocket and by miracle pulls out something that wasn't actually even there. He says, be amazed at someone who that puts their hand in the pocket and doesn't find something, but their state doesn't change as a result because they're firm upon the deen. And he says that it was said to one of the righteous, I've seen so-and-so walking on water. And he says, He says that, as for my opinion, is that someone that Allah Ta'ala has made them in a state of being in control over their ego is greater to me than seeing someone walk or in water or fly through the air. But this comes with zuhd, detachment. And then, again, there's multiple that statements that point to the same meaning is that it's not just about outward worship or remembering Allah often or fasting a lot or that being in states of solitude for prolonged periods of time but really that it's about zuhd now keep in mind we already had the aphorism is that no act that emanates from the heart is deemed to be small if someone's a zahid if they are truly detached from this world. And that no act is deemed to be great and bring about a lot of reward if it emanates from the heart of a raghib, someone who's desirous of this world. So what a blessed piece of advice for him to really teach us about these meanings. And this is the hope, is that by learning these meanings that you and I can try our best. This is a lofty, these are lofty meanings that take uh, oftentimes that extended period of time to attain. But we start by learning and by making the intention to strive to the, mid, to the extent of, that we can. And Allah Ta'ala is generous and He'll open up the doors for us. Ta'ala. The secret is in striving because then more doors open up. Allah guides us when we strive. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. So may Allah Ta'ala give us tawfiq and that may He fold up the distance for us uh, of this world. And allow us to be able to see the hereafter closer to us than our own selves. Ya Rahman Rahmin. Bless us to be people of yaqeen and certitude and to they work tirelessly day in and day out for the ever approaching hereafter. Ya Rahman Rahmin. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept us and bless our deeds to be like the deeds of those who are close to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Open up the doors for us to travel the path and to come to know him. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa alayhi wa sallam. Wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.